education system nor the legislation and school practice is characterized by exclusion and segregation. Currently, 66 up to 80 percent of children with disabilities are in special schools in the Netherlands. But even if the CRPD is not yet binding in the Netherlands, international law, we feel, research and emerging jurisprudence is on our side. Inclusive education is a human right. In order to reach our ambitious goals, we need the best experts who know what they are talking about. The In One School project team consists almost completely of people with visible and invisible impairments of all kinds and parents of children with disabilities who struggle daily to prevent or end exclusion of their children. Now I would like to share some main findings of our research. First of all, we had a legal opinion made by EDF Professor Lisa Waddington and Carly Tupke. The main questions of this research was if and how the right to inclusive education is guaranteed in international treaties, specifically the CRC and the CRPD. The conclusions are that state parties are legally obliged to offer accessible and inclusive education on all levels to every child. The CRPD mentions almost the same obligations as the CRC, but more detailed and explicit than the CRC. The right to inclusive education is enshrined in both CRC and CRPD. Exclusion, segregation, as well as denial of reasonable accommodation and accessibility in mainstream education violate the respective articles in both conventions. As far as we know, this legal opinion is the first in the English-speaking world. For DPOs and NGOs worldwide, it is important to have such legal opinions which interpret the content of human rights treaties and compare them to their respective domestic laws. If we don't have a right to inclusive education in domestic law and practice, we have to take recourse to international human rights treaties. Secondly, I wanted to talk a little bit about our jurisprudence research by Jacqueline Schoenheim. We did an analysis of 166 Dutch cases and 40 cases from other countries and European courts on the right to inclusive education according to the CRC and the CRPD and European Human Rights Law. I'll skip this part in order to stick to the time uh, limit, but you can find more information on our website, www.inoneschool.nl. I skip to the third education, which I particularly want to, uh, the third research what I want to talk about, that's the, about practices of inclusive education by Helene Hartwold. More than 100 video fragments with examples of uh, inclusive education are collected. The research identified the following success factors for inclusive education. The first is celebrating diversity in the whole school and with all involved. This is an essential thing. Second, school is a community to learn with and from each other. Teacher, student, student, teacher, and peer to peer. Key also are high expectations from all learners. What counts is dedication progress made and social behavior. The fourth success factor is the child as an individual. That's the central thing. This calls for workshop teaching with possibilities for differentiating and universal design for learning. The main question of the teacher is how can we support every learner to be successful? Co-teaching is another thing. Teachers work together and teaching takes place mainly in the class. Sixth, Peer-to-peer -peer assistance. Children learn more from their age peers than from others. This also stimulates a feeling of competence and strengthens relations. Then leadership. The director of the school is advisor and stimulator of the process to inclusive education. Eight, curriculum differentiating. Teachers have freedom to develop individual learning paths within the general curriculum. Nine, Supportive policy from community, region, and government. And ten, cooperation between all stakeholders, like parents, teachers, students, experts, management, and other personnel. These success, success factors illustrate what mainstream schools need to change to become inclusive schools. Then, last research I want to talk about is on practices of inclusive education. Research on these practices. Ruis in 
2015 concluded that the presence of learners that need extra care in mainstream school, like students with severe learning or behavioral problems, does not negatively influence the school results of their fellow <coughs> student. She found this in both primary and secondary education. She analyzed, therefore, the scores of end tests of more than 462,000 primary school kids and the exam results of more than 518,000 secondary school students. The research of the Graaf of 2014 analyzed research results on the effect of participation in regular schools. He concludes that children with an intellectual disability develop better in language and experience better school results in regular schools than in special schools. And lastly, Wokken from 2005 concludes that the longer a learner stays in special education, the worse her or his results will be in spelling and in IQ tests. In concluding, distinguished members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share with you what we need from the general comment, Article 24, in order to stimulate, strengthen and speed up the implementation of inclusive education for all children all over the world. We need, one, a clear statement from the CRPD committee that Article 24 proclaims the right to inclusive education for all children. All children can learn. No child should be tested whether or not they are fit to attend a school before they are granted access to school. Second, we need a statement about the negative impact of segregated education on opportunities, self-esteem and dignity of individual children and the segregation in society at large, now and in the future. We need a statement to attract attention to the core purpose of education, the complete development of human potential and the sense of dignity and self-esteem as mentioned in Article 24 and as contrary to utility-driven education. Fourth, we wish for an explanation on the nature and core elements of inclusive education. We gladly point here to the recent thematic study of the OHCHR. Five, we need a statement on the obligations of state parties in education, in particular the obligations to invest in and work on a structural basis on the accessibility of all schools. So without waiting for the first person to ask for individual accommodations, and in the meantime that person having to try to survive in accessibility. Six, we need a firm statement from the committee that the reasonable accommodation clause may not be used as an excuse to exclude children, while mainstream schools remain inaccessible and not inclusive. Seven, we wish for a statement that special schools most often lead to segregation and that segregated edu education is not equal and does not allow and prepare for participation in the community. Eight, and I'm almost done, we need clear-cut recommendations to state parties to spread information on the nature and core elements of inclusive education among policymakers, education professionals and parents. We need recommendations to state parties that the whole legal system meaning judges, lawyers, attorneys, and complaint committees need to be educated on the CRPD, especially on Article 24, and on the use of human rights treaties in general in court cases. Attention is also needed on the superseding nature of international human rights treaties above national or regional legislation. And lastly, we need the whole treaty body system, starting with the CRC, CEDAW, and CRPD, to structurally question segregated education as discrimination for all learners to ask for data on children in special education and to bring up the need for action on inclusive education in every constructive dialogue with all state parties. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Van Weinen. And now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Mr. Richard Reiser, Reiser Ward of Inclusion, uh, Disabled Pers per People International. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for asking me to, to speak. Yeah, I'm speaking on behalf of my own uh, consultancy, World of Inclusion, but also on behalf of Disabled People International, which uh, our UK council is a member of, and I've been asked by them to represent them internationally on uh, inclusive education issues. DPI represents 140 country uh, councils with cross-impairment organisation, and why it's important, it was DPI in uh, 1980 
that walked out of Rehabilitation International because they couldn't stand the medical model thinking that was being applied to disabled people. And that historic date, 25 years later, led to the Convention. It also led to a change in thinking about disability, from seeing it as a problem in the person uh, to be fixed, to being a social problem that was to do with attitudes, barriers of organisation, culture uh, and uh, organisation. That has been characterised as the paradigm shift in the Convention. And nowhere is this clearer than in Article 24. And in fact, while we were formulating it, I had the pleasure to be part of the ad hoc committee, it was this issue that led to the most contentious debates, three big debates, over whether there should be choice for segregation, which was a position put forward by quite a lot of people. I haven't heard anybody arguing for that today, so we clearly have moved on, uh, and that's very important. So the committee needs to look at the wording of Article 24 because it represented the views at the time, and we have moved on. So we definitely need a definition of inclusion that we couldn't get agreement on between the disabled organisations we couldn't get an agreement on at the time. I think now you can make one. And I think that would be very helpful to countries to do it. There are a number of drafts in the documents that have been put forward, so I'm not going to tell you which one to pick, but I'm going to uh, elaborate through the work. I've also uh, circulated to the committee, I haven't got enough copies to give everybody else, this piece of work I did for the Commonwealth a couple of years ago, implementing Article 24, and there are 170 examples from 55, well, 70 countries in there. We went beyond the Commonwealth. Um, it's also available as a PDF uh, and a Word document on my website. So I want to draw from some of those thoughts, but the overriding thing that came from that view of disabled people and the watchword of making the convention was from the DPI slogan, nothing about us without us, was important because that has failed to be what has happened in many countries as governments have gone to implement the convention. They have not consulted disabled people's organisation by and large and they should have done. They've also not uh, had disability equality training, which is vital to actually understand this paradigm shift, because you do, it's not intuitive to actually see that it's the problems that someone who has a cognitive impairment or a physical impairment or a sensory impairment, it's not their impairment that's the problem. It's the society, and people need training to understand that new way. So I hope the committee will be arguing for that. Now, if we map in the thinking change that we had from a traditional view which basically denied disabled people any rights at all, hardly accepted them, certainly were not in, in education, uh, to a medical model view which first of all segregated us as the only place where the expertise was to do nothing with us essentially, certainly didn't provide education, didn't provide opportunities, warehoused in the main, uh, to bringing that into schools but we had to to, through integration, we had to manage in the schools as they were. Those models are all not acceptable in the paradigm shift. So if you're going by the paradigm shift in the convention, you have to go to inclusion, by which we mean inclusive schools where all are welcomed and staff, parents and pupils value diversity and support is provided so that all can successfully academically and socially uh, thrive. This re requires reorganisation what people do in schools. It's not about reorganising the person. A number of speakers have said that. Now, around this, uh, I was asked by uh, UNICEF a couple of years ago to look at how we prepare teachers around the world for uh, children with disabilities. And it was quite interesting. We did a survey of over 1,000 educationalists. We uh, looked at many examples. We did very extensive literature research. It's all on my website, this document. And we came up with something that I think changed things a little bit. Because what we'd had after Education for All, the Dakar Convention in 1990, was a move to a much more general definition of inclusion. And as a result of that, when the focus in the 90s had been on getting kids with SEN, or disabilities, into education, the focus came off disabled children. And net result now, 40% of the out of school children are disabled children. Now that's the effect of two things. One, this change of focus, but two, that uh, the system is uh, not capable of actually including them. So what we need to do, one of the key things, not all of the things, many of the, I agree with the list entirely just read out, but I want to focus on teachers. We need to look at teachers. Teachers need training in 
their ability to uh, include. And that means a change for many teachers around the world from a chalk and talk, I'm in charge position to a child-centred approach where they co the children collaborate in the classroom. That's a big challenge for many countries, particularly in the developing world. It means moving away from a grade system, because in the grade system, when I went to Lesotho, I found a child of 21 in a primary class. Why? He hadn't passed the grade test. That is what is actually happening in many countries in the world, and it is against the convention. It's not acceptable. So really, in challenging, you're going to challenge the fundamentals of how education is actually organised around the world. That's why we haven't made progress, because we haven't understood and challenged what needs to change. We need uh, peer support. We need to empower young people. We need to empower young people to understand the difference uh, and where the oppression towards disabled people has come from. I've just done a very interesting project with six schools, which is on my website and on the Anti-Bullying Alliance website, using disabled and non-disabled young people to challenge bullying, and I think that could be useful to the committee to look at. The second thing that teachers need to be trained, and this is all teachers, they need to be trained to understand the specific adjustments that we need to make for different types of impairment. And this is where we fell down with education. For all, we had a general inclusion, let's include everybody, but we didn't equip teachers how we include them. So we need training on how you work with blind and visually impaired, deaf and hearing impaired students, physical impairment, speech and communication, specific learning difficulty, autism, general cognitive impairment, mental health and behaviour. And when we're looking at accessibility around those things, it's not just about textbooks, Gopal, uh, in accessible formats for blind and visually impaired. It's also about easy read uh, for students with learning difficulties at the right level of the curriculum, but easy to understand. So that's a bigger challenge. So we need to prepare teachers, and I would suggest the committee recommends mandatory training, not just for pre-service, but all in-service. And what we found out from the study was that the best way to do that was not to take people out and train one person who we hope would train the rest of the school, but whole training of the school, get a local college or university to accredit it, and then all the teachers get professional accreditation for doing uh, the course and becoming reflective practitioners, and they get a rise in salary. And it's very important, right, to finish, that if we're expecting teachers to do all of these things, that we remunerate them properly. They are playing a vital role, and in many, many parts of the world, they are paid appallingly, have terrible conditions, often have to do three jobs. You cannot expect professionals to develop in that sort of way that we expect of them unless state parties recognise education costs, and it's, they're going to have to pay for it in order for it to be inclusive and effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Razor. And now, Ms. Paula Hunt. Senior Inclusive Education Expert, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. In the few minutes that I have this afternoon to address you on the issue of inclusive education, I would like to start by further stressing the words of Ms. Catalina de Vandas, the Special Rapporteur on the Right of Persons with Disabilities. While it is true that we need to further clarify the concept of inclusive education, this concept is not new. Even before the discussions that led to the Salamanca Statement, inclusive education was a topic of discussion. At some point, we have to stop discussing and move on to action that is decisive, holistic, and transformative. Although I am sitting amongst friends and colleagues who are also persons with disabilities, I would like to stress that inclusive education is not just about children with disabilities. Rather, it is about quality education for all children, including children with disabilities. And certainly, inclusive education is not integration, nor is it mainstreaming. We have spent the last 25 years discussing legislative and policy reform, as well as states' responsibilities towards children with disabilities. The reality is that even countries that have exemplary inclusive regulatory frameworks face challenges in implementation that often lead to perpetuate segregation. Again, calling on Mr. Vanda's words, what is needed is clear, concise, and practical guidance on the implementation of Article 24. To accomplish any further movement, I would go a bit further and specify 
that what we need is to empower the front line of education, and that is teachers and children, to implement inclusive education. Inclusive education includes many things, but inclusive education will not be realized unless those who work in the classrooms believe in and are empowered to enact upon it. Inclusive education is, as it, co as, as it cores, good education, good teaching for all children. Therefore, practical guidance needs to focus on the beliefs, the attitudes, the knowledge, and the skills of teachers for all children. First, not everyone can be a teacher. Investing in teacher education is ultimately investing in a country that is richer in both social and cultural capital. Practical guidance should ensure that pre-service institutions seek retain and mentor exceptional citizens that believe in the right of all children to education. Second, attitudes are informed by personal beliefs. Social change, the paradigm shift, is the responsibility of all, but in education is the responsibility of teachers, those who set the standards of acceptable behaviors. The right of the child to quality education should not be compromised, and teachers and other children are at the forefront of social change. We must provide them with the space and the resources to do what is right. Third, knowledges must be freely shared if inclusive education is to be realized. We have spent close to a century preparing teachers to work in silos, all in the name of specialized professions. If specialized teaching worked, we would not be here today. While there is a space and a need for specialized knowledge, this is too often not transferable to the general classroom. We must aim to provide teachers with the necessary knowledge and the related skills that lead to their ability to differentiate instruction, to respond to students' strengths and building upon their dreams and their aspirations. In all cases of successful inclusive practices, the empowerment of teachers to work creatively, cooperatively, and in child-centered ways is at the core of the success. This is a fact that is very often overlooked. Inclusive education is not about fitting a child with a disability in a mainstream school. Inclusive education requires the creation of classrooms, schools, and systems that are responsive to children and adapt to their strengths and their dreams. Universal design for learning, differentiated instruction, cooperative teaching and learning, positive behavior management, multidisciplinary team building and decision making, ICTs, and assistive technologies are all important elements of inclusive education. But inclusive education is not an add-on to existing systems. It requires the involvement and the full participation of teachers and children themselves, without which we will continue to fall short in realizing Article 24. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take the time. Um, now I would like to invite to take a floor Dr. Pravina Sakraj Ilai former Deputy Chairperson of South Africa Council for the Blind. A very good afternoon to you all. I am presenting today on behalf of the World Blind Union and the International Council for the Education of People with Visual Impairment. Hence, my, my submission today focuses primarily on the right to education of learners with visual impairments. What constitutes quality education for learners with visual impairments? the barriers that impedes its implementation, and recommendations to transcend these barriers will be articulated. As mentioned previously, Article 24 provides that all children should receive an inclusive quality education. Unlike certain other disabilities, children, certain children require minimal adjustments to be effectively included in mainstream environments. Learners with visual impairments, however, require unique learning, teaching, and assessment methods in order to access quality, inclusive education. Further, we need to note that learners with visual impairments are not a homogenous group,
but have diverse individual education needs. This is as a result of diverse, different eye conditions, capabilities, and overall circumstances. Aside from merely having access, physical access to the school environment, learners with visual impairment require access to the academic curriculum. This curriculum needs to be flexible and open for adaptation. Areas in mathematics and science are currently being, being neglected uh, with visually impaired learners and hence need to be given particular focus. Learners with visual impairment require social interactive skills, activities of daily living skills, braille skills, orientation and mobility skills to be included as part of the curriculum. Reasonable accommodations need to be provided during the learning, teaching, and assess assessment processes. When, what do we mean by providing reasonable accommodations during the, learning, during the learning process? Learners need to be given learning material in accessible, in accessible format of their choice, whether be it in braille, large print, electronic, audio formats, etc. Further, alternative methods of assessments need to be devised where it is clear that current assessment techniques are inappropriate. For example, you cannot expect a blind child to be assessed on a, giving a critical analysis of a picture. It is unfortunate, however, that countries currently lack guidelines and human resources on how to interpret and implement reasonable accommodations, which is clearly to the detriment of visually impaired learners. Currently, providing support, a specialist support and services is a very contentious issue in various countries. It is various advocates promote for specialist support to be provided entirely in mainstream school settings, while other advocates uh, while other advocates provide that there is a continued role for specialist supports to be provided by specialist centers. Inaccessibility of, of textbooks in large print and braille, unaffordable technology devices, untrained educators, and insufficient specialist support are common experiences of learners with visual impairment. Even in developed countries where, where children have been been mainstreamed since the 1970s. Research has shown that children receive material late, are supported by untrained ancillary workers, receive patchy, receive patchy O and M orientation and mobility support, are socially isolated and bullied, and socially excluded. The responsibilities of special, special, special support and services are seen as the role of specialist centers rather than the role of mainstream schools. It is argued that two parallel systems of mainstream and special education allow for mainstream schools to stagnate and strive towards limited inclusive development, as it is, is, is assumed that the special education system will take care of all those children who the mainstream school cannot, cannot cater for. States need more understanding on the roles and responsibilities of specialist support and services within the inclusion, inclusion environment. The key issue is not, is not where the support services are based, but rather that support services and procedures must, must be embedded in inclusion, and every possible step must be taken to end and prevent segregation in inclusion. The International Council for the Education of Visual Impairment and the World Blind Union have in 2006 initiated an Education for All Visually Impaired campaign. However, the reality is that 90% of learners with visual impairment receive no education at all, be it in inclusive or, or in specialist settings. Clearly, states are struggling with domesticating and implementing Article 24 of the UNCRPD. States are, are increasingly drafting inclusive education policies, which I must say must be commended. However, these policies are standalone policies, with the country's core education policies remaining unchanged. Hence, these are basically form, uh, former special education policies with a different title. 
The other problem that we currently face is that, article, that countries are focusing primarily on basic education and early identification, early childhood identification, intervention and education, which is essential for preparing children to be included in mainstream environments, is currently given no focus. Further to that, higher education, post-secondary education, be it vocational, vocational training, adult basic education, etc., are not given any focus. It is argued that inclusive education is not implemented because special, special support uh, services, human resources, and technology are too costly. And due to social cuts in spending, etc., policy trade-offs trade result in priorities being given to other basic services like water, housing, health, etc., rather than education. Clearly, states need to be encouraged to have a time-bound, costed inclusive education implementation plan. National governments need to take ownership of the inclusive education policies. Foreign donors alone cannot be responsible for implementing inclusive education. And there have been several examples where donor funding has been ineffectively managed and utilized. A technology strategy needs to be encouraged to be devised in, in, various, in all developing and developed countries as technology is a powerful tool that can be used to, for visually impaired learners to have access to the curriculum. In conclusion, I, I have a few points that I want to make. In, international experience has shown that inclusive education has not occurred overnight but has been a gradual process. Ongoing research and investigation need to be done for best inclusive education practices to take effect. And finally, there needs to be significant focus placed on the education rights of deaf-blind learners and learners who are visually impaired with multiple disabilities because these children are falling by the wayside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sakharachi Lai. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Juan Cabenas from Association Azul from Argentina. The floor is yours. Hola. Liz? Good afternoon. I would like to thank you. for making it possible for me to be here. As a child, I was a representative within my special education school. But there, I didn't. Receive I didn't really receive true education and they said this boy is not motivated we can't educate him There is no way that we can manage to educate him. There is no suitable pedagogy available. I was six years old.
Luego, mi mamá. Then, my mother. Began to look at how children like me were educated in other parts of the world. She discovered this system of communication. An augmentative alternative communication system. And She then began to help me embark upon an education. At the age of nine, I began school. Or I entered into mainstream school in an integrated fashion. With special education provisions. Con mis apoyos. And I received support. Pero estos venían de, venían de mi familia. But this came from my family. Las maes, maestras de la the teachers in school, in this special education school, Me ponían muchos obstáculos, obstáculos. Made me afraid and put a lot of barriers in my path. This was humiliating. and very painful. And today, it still makes me afraid when I think about this. Nevertheless, the 
with the help from some authorities, they stopped teaching me in an integrated fashion and I alone was taught, I was taught within the mainstream. En la común me he sen sentido en mi lugar. In this mainstream system then, I felt more at ease. Sé que ser alumno I know that being a pupil in this environment helped me and I very much enjoyed it. And it was also beneficial to my fellow classmates. También a mis docentes. And my teachers. who learnt how to teach more successfully. Ahora estudio letras. Now I am studying literature at university and I would like A la lingüística. To specialize in linguistics. In order to find out more about augmentative alternative communication. Without this A A C No Podría. Without this form of communication, I would not 
have been able to learn. And I would not have been able to learn without all of the assistance I have been afforded. I all have always had personal assistance in school. Yo los formé. No deben hacer nada, nada más que poder. I trained my teachers as they worked and they simply facilitated my communication. That is all they need to do. School is there to educate me. A mí me parece que I believe that my teachers siempre supieron que always knew that I had the right to be there. Facilitó todo. And this made everything possible. Para eso... Nos comunicábamos mi familia. mi familia yo this was why my family, myself, and my teachers communicated with one another all the time. Ahora, en la universidad, now I am at university. I know what we need to do. Para hacer la inclusión. I know what we need to do in order to ensure that inclusion becomes easier. Ofrecer siempre la explicación de los apoyos. An explanation must always be given regarding the support and assistance that we need.
formar parte de grupos de alumnos con discapacidad. Groups of students with disability must be supported and included and work with teachers and the authorities to provide them training. en el medio. Saber que la la lucha no saber que la lucha no termina everyone must know that we have not concluded our fight. Thank you very much. so much mr juan cabenas for your such for your for sharing uh, uh, your such an inspiring story now we have uh, uh, no more than 20 minutes left so i am inviting to take floor ms elin martinez researcher from human rights watch Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I appreciate you told us, you gave us guidance to be as interactive as possible, so I'll try and I'll also limit my statement, which is about nine minutes long, but I'll, I'll try my very best. Um, I thank as well the Secretariat for uh, including us in this panel. Um, we've heard from uh, education policy experts, disability experts, as well as, as from young people themselves. So we're bringing here some of the examples based on our own research and advocacy uh, in many countries. Um, I mean, Human Rights Watch has focused on the right to education and the rights of persons with disabilities for many years. We have conducted a number of investigations on the right to education uh, for people with disabilities in China, Nepal, Russia, and most recently in South Africa and the Central African Republic. Um, and I will refer to a few examples uh, in my statement, uh, but just to note that our findings are emblematic of the situation in many countries, as we have heard today. Uh, I call on them to bring in the stories, as, as some other colleagues have said, uh, and to inject um, yeah, real examples of what we have seen. Um, I mean, following global trends, some of these countries I've listed have claimed near universal enrollment of all children in primary education. Uh, but we should interrogate whether uh, governments can claim universality and access in cases where hundreds of thousands of children, mostly children with disabilities, uh, remain out of school. Um, I mean, it's, uh, we've heard today a lot of examples based on primary, and education, uh, primary education, but it's not just in early childhood, preschool and primary education where many of the barriers and discrimination affect children with disabilities. In fact, as we have heard just now, uh, by the time children reach secondary education, those barriers are fully cemented. Um, we have found that many children with disabilities who attend secondary education, as well as young adults with disabilities who access higher education or vocational training, barely get the visibility they need within education systems. And resources needed to ensure there is full inclusion throughout the entire education system are often absent or simply not considered a priority, despite the fact that all children have the right to progress into further levels of education. Um, to, what other, to add to what other colleagues have presented today, particularly appreciating that I'm one of the last speakers and I need to call on something new to say, um, I, I want to highlight two uh, very important things that need to be considered when addressing support in the general education system. 
Firstly, uh, it's the children with disabilities who are discriminated against uh, through the progressive realization card. And namely, in our research, we have found that these are children with intellectual and multiple disabilities, children with autism spectrum disorders, but not necessarily just them. There are many children, and it depends on the context. Um, but these are precisely the children who often enter the system very late because of the multiple barriers and discrimination they face, with limited exposure to early years stimulation or education, and with higher, far higher chances of dropping out of the system early on. Secondly, um, and this is something that we really want to reinforce, is just adolescents and young adults with disabilities who may be in or out of primary or secondary education, but whose right to education has not been fully realized because they have not received quality education on an equal basis with other students, or they have dropped out because of a lack of reasonable accommodation when proceeding on to other levels of education. Um, and very often we hear governments justify taking a much longer time to accommodate these children, uh, those with various intellectual and multiple disabilities, because they argue it takes more financial resources, more support, and more time to provide education for these children. In our experience, these are the children who are actually placed in special schools the most, without any due consideration or assessment of individual measures that would ensure they learn together with other students in inclusive settings, in schools attended by all children. Uh, by doing so, the governments have not only just segregated children, uh, contrary to in inclusive education obligations, but they have placed a very significant limitation on what children will do later in life. Um, again, just as examples, in Nepal, China, or South Africa, Human Rights Watch has interviewed many children, uh, adolescents and young people who have not accessed education, because the schools uh, have told them that they could not be educated in mainstream settings. Uh, some have been deemed edu uneducable, as we have heard, just heard from Juan. Um, and parents have often just called them, or school officials will call, have called parents up to let them know the children could not stay in their schools. Schools usually say they simply cannot deal with them, uh, despite having the obligation, absolute obligation to find ways to accommodate them. Um, I mean, in Russia, for example, Human Rights Watch found that over one-third of children with disabilities are placed in state institutions, mm -hmm. and once there, they have almost no access to mainstream schools, and studying special schools or separate special needs classrooms with a very limited curriculum. Overall, there are very few efforts, world, I think, in many countries, uh, or virtually no efforts, to incentivize ordinary schools to enroll these children, for example, by increasing the number of fully trained teachers or teacher assistants trained in inclusive education. Human Rights Watch has generally found that many children with disabilities are exposed to education which does not guarantee any quality. We heard this from a special rapporteur on education. We've heard this from many speakers today. Um, in the worst case, this means that many children with disabilities may be enrolled, uh, so satisfying the condition to enroll all children, uh, but they sit or lie in classrooms with no stimulation and no actual learning. Um, the education they receive does not uphold the aims of education uh, that are envisioned by various human rights treaties. Um, during a recent research mission I conducted in South Africa, I encountered many adolescents and young adults who were out of school and had not completed compulsory basic education, and many who had passed through the doors of special schools without getting e any equality education. In one case, uh, which really marked me, I visited a skills center for adults with intellectual disabilities, which in the current context is the next obvious step for many people with intellectual disabilities. When I asked how many people registered in the center had completed basic education, I was told that none of the students had actually finished compulsory education. Um, this center is not necessarily a center for empowerment and skill strengthening. It's a way to it's for, ch for people to remain in a protective environment. Even when uh, some of the students finish a course, many go back uh, because nothing awaits them in their communities. Uh, according to the director, the majority of students enrolled had not learned basic skills and competencies to enable them to live in an independent life. Uh, the deficiencies of the education system and limitations imposed based on their disabilities mean that many of the students arrive without gaining any skills, sense of independence or self-worth. Uh, had schools adopted early on and education officials enforced personalized measures and individual education plans to support children to learn and teachers been adequately trained to address those needs, many would have been able to follow a different education path and not arrive at that center. We specifically met one 25-year-old man who has ep epilepsy. Uh, his name is Francis. Um, he could read, write, follow the daily news, and represent his peers in the, center, in the center's governing body, not because he had learned that in school, but because his grandfather had taught him. Uh, when we asked him about his education journey, he had been to three schools. One was a mainstream school that said very early on he couldn't be there. Another, second, uh, a special school, uh, which he couldn't afford to go to because schools charge uh, fees. Um, and then he landed in the most convenient nearby special school uh, that could that admitted him. 
Um, he arrived at the, at the skill center we met, we uh, visited without completing basic education and currently at attends the beat section of the center. He makes bracelets on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, in, his, in his case, he could not be managed or accommodated in his previous schools. He, only, he had epilepsy. They called him naughty and hyperactive. Um, now, one of the greatest challenges is the fact that the center cannot provide education catch-up opportunities for all the young adults uh, who have not completed education because they're beyond compulsory education. Uh, it falls on, I mean, more so the education obligation falls under the government, uh, so under the education ministry, uh, but because there's such little synergy between governmental departments, it's the social development department that, I mean, does not provide education. Um, I choose this example, and we have many uh, within Human Rights Watch to illustrate what happens to many young adults with disabilities who are sent down uh, the special schools path with limited opportunities to benefit from the type of education ambition in the convention. Um, I'm going to go straight to the recommendations because I see that um, um, my minute. colleague has just given me one minute. Um, a bigger, I mean, one of the issues before I go into that is just simply the progression. And I think that's one thing that the general comment really needs to look at. Um, simply saying that a, 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 chul, uh, sorry, a child is no longer of school going age does not remove government's responsibility to provide education to that child. Education is compulsory, it's an absolute obligation, um, and if it's not done, uh, education is denied uh, to many people with disabilities. If I can just very quickly say one or two recommendations. Um, the burden to fight and find schools should not rest with parents of children, and decisions of schooling should not be based on having to choose the worst, least worst option. Uh, governments must address the limited enrollment of children with high levels of support and needs. Um, and where schools have discriminated against children, governments have a fundamental obligation to redress the situation and ensure they are enrolled in the most suitable inclusive learning environment. And dropouts require as much effort. It's not just simply that children do no longer need education. Um, and secondly, governments should really focus on providing uh, basic and further education opportunities, uh, and this should be at the forefront of many of the government's policies, particularly where governments have failed to guarantee quality education for children with disabilities. The current generation, as many speakers spoke to, that have not been able to access education, they have a right to. Um, and quality, finally, which other speakers have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Martinez. And now I would like to give a floor to the last speaker. Uh, Ms. Sin Holstein, a representative of the Disabled People Organization from Denmark. Thank you to the committee for organizing this important debate and for inviting Disabled People's Organization Denmark to contribute. We have chosen to focus on participation of children, parents and Disabled People's Organizations in establishing inclusive compulsory education. The Danish compulsory education is in the middle of a transition from segregated special schools for some children with disabilities and integration in ordinary education for other children with disabilities. In this transition, we focus on headmasters and teachers and pedagogues and parents as important actors. However, in our perspective, the children are the main actors. Social relations are the most efficient vehicle for inclusion and we have to cre create an environment where all children are e equally partaking in the activities in the classroom. Denmark is a wealthy country, but though we have used huge resources on education, the resources, the resources have not always been used in the best way. During the years with integration, we have seen children with disabilities literally placed in a corner of the classroom and isolated behind barriers of assistive devices. Furthermore, children have been provided with special pedagogues or assistive teachers. Through lack of knowledge and supervision, these pedagogues and teachers have played a role as the contact between the disabled child and other children in the class. Thereby, children experience, experience that the efforts to include them actually led to exclusion, and this has nothing to do with inclusive education. Counseling with young persons with disabilities, they have told us devastating stories about the school time. Stories about being bullied, about loneliness and isolation. And we need to break this evil circle, and we are working concentrated and systematically to do so. The inclusion agenda is backed by disability organizations and politicians. 
But when we experience unqualified efforts labelled inclusive education, we lose support for this agenda. We see two paths necessary to follow. One is constantly implementing research and evidence-based knowledge, not only as examples of best practice, but implementation on a broad basis. The second path is to acknowledge that children with and without disabilities are those persons living inclusion on a daily basis. They are the real experts and those who know what works and what does not work. Their information needs to be collected and transformed to general practices and utilized on a broad basis. To do so, we have established collaboration with the pupils organization. They tell us that children without disabilities do want to establish strong relationships with their disabled peers, but they feel uncertain on how to act and what to do. Are there do's and don'ts, stupid or intimidating questions? And also, teachers feel uncomfortable when they are to talk about disabilities. This uncertainty often leads to taboo. In other situations, children with disabilities tell us that teachers often with the best intentions, talk so much about disability that there's nothing left but children with disabilities are also ordinary boys and girls with interests, dreams and ambitions they want to share with their peers. Therefore, the shared experience from children with and without disabilities is that it is needed to establish an open atmosphere where question can, questions can be posed but not run out of proportion. Of course, there are necessary knowledge to share on different, and different things to know dependent on if you, for instance, are classmate with a child who is a wheelchair user or has autism. This is not to be glossed out or neglected. Other experiences children with disabilities have shared with us are that inclusion cannot be isolated to learning activities. It has to be present in any activity in or related to school for instance, breaks, excursions, and birthday parties. Therefore, parents to both children with and without disabilities are to be involved, and we have established fruitful collaboration with the parents' associations. They work focused to gain parent support for social inclusion. This collaboration also has gained understanding for the viewpoint that children with disabilities must be part of local school, and thereby they become stronger represented in local life. Children with and without disabilities highlight that knowledge and support is needed to establish more lasting uh, and fruitful relations. Teachers can use systems of peers learning and mentors constructively. It can be used for learning, but it can also be used to raise awareness that your classmate have, classmates have competences and knowledge you did not see at a first glance. This knowledge can be utilized in collaboration, in friendships, and in leisure activities. Our overall conclusion is that what is needed is to implement evidence-based knowledge, acknowledge that children themselves are the real experts, and establish lasting relations between different stakeholders with disabled people's organizations in a strong position. The slogan, nothing about us without us, applies equally to disabled people's organizations and to children with disabilities, and that has to be acknowledged if we are to turn successfully to inclusive education. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much to all panelists. And now we have time for questions, or questions and discussions, and, uh, but time is very limited. So uh, we have three requests already, and uh, I invite these people uh, to take floor, to make comments or to raise questions. But uh, please take care. We have, the time is limited. The time for your statement is please not, uh, not, uh, not uh, run out than two minutes. So Marco Jokinen from the World Federation of Deaf, please take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'll just wait for the camera to be adjusted for the web streaming. Apologies. Okay?
Okay, thank you. Camera is ready, interpreter is ready. Thank you all for your presentations. I have a comment slash question. You all know that the UN Convention itself does not define inclusive education. But at the same time, there are some basic concepts mentioned, universal design, accessibility, reasonable accommodation, individual support, and the non-discrimination principle. These elements mentioned in the CRPD could add up to inclusive education. They're all linked to inclusive education. I don't know if any committee members or panel members have ever looked into the, let's say, the interplay between these five factors I just mentioned and how they're interlinked. And what all these factors mean for different groups of people with disabilities. We could assume that accessibility, universal design, reasonable accommodation, individual support and non-discrimination should all be met. And if all those criteria are met, then schools, teaching materials, etc. will be inclusive. So full inclusion would need all these five criteria I mentioned. But I'm not sure if this has been uh, analyzed yet on a conceptual level or on a practical level before. To further illustrate this, I would like to suggest that we need to clearly define these five factors, what they mean for different groups of people, different disabilities, and what they mean for, for education to be truly and fully inclusive. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jokinen. And now uh, I'd invite, inviting to the floor Ms. Tina Minkovic, the president of the Center for Human Rights of Users and Survivors in Psychiatry. Thank you, Chair, but I think that I made enough points this morning. I'll pass and let you go on. Thank you. So, last uh, speaker, I'm inviting Ms. Malakias, parent of the child with the, the, the disability. Please take floor. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a mother of uh, three children and I also sit on the board of Down Syndrome Australia but I'm here today um, in my personal capacity as an advocate and as the parent of a child um, with an intellectual disability. Um, I would just like to make a comment about the importance of uh, inclusive school cultures to the realisation of inclusive education. I live in Australia and we have in all our state jurisdictions um, legal and policy frameworks that purport to provide for inclusive education. Um, however, it is my view that this has uh, been insufficient. Um, as well as adequate resourcing um, and teacher training, the successful implementation of inclusive education requires governments to invest in fostering inclusive school cultures. Um, within the school community, amongst teachers, amongst parents and more broadly as a whole. Uh, this is necessary to dislodge entrenched historical attitudes that default to segregation as the appropriate model. Um, uh, there are many barriers that continue to entrench uh, the exclusion status, status quo in Australia and elsewhere, but I'd just like to mention some that I feel um, are important in that context. Um, as a parent, um, the lack of information for parents, um, teachers in the general community about the evidence-based and universal benefits of inclusive education. Uh, we can't make choices unless they are appropriate informed choices. So. Um, Uninformed choices are um, practically meaningless. Um, we be I believe that it's um, government's role to ensure that that is happening. Um, states also need to stop seeking refuge in the um, superficially palatable position that it's the parent's decision as to whether a child is educated in an inclusive or a segregated setting. 
and this continues to enable discrimination against the rights of the child. Um, uh, also, um, the medical model that continues to underpin the education of students with disability. Um, this must also be challenged. Resources are allocated um, at the moment based on uh, medical labels. They should be allocated ac across the classroom and be based on functional and educational needs of all students, regardless of um, label. Um, uh, so, um, universal design for learning is obviously um, something that needs to happen in um, our jurisdictions uh, more broadly. Um, and also, um, dual systems, maintaining dual systems of special um, and mainstream schools. Um, uh, there is at the moment a comparatively higher funding of special education. This sets that system up as a superior and better resourced model and a, a lot of parents make decisions based on that. My child was, is just going to get more in that setting. Um, so um, basically, um, yes, so uh, resources need to uh, be allocated um, differently and um, inclusive education needs to be given the scope to uh, grow um, in a vibrant way and not be stunted by a dual um, special system that sits alongside and to which parents and students are um, sort of uh, continuously uh, pressured to, um, to, to um, default to. So um, in my view, um, an inclusive culture is the atmosphere necessary for an inclusive education system. Um, and the administrators, teachers and students, particularly those with disability comprising that system, um, uh, uh, they, need to, uh, they need it to evolve and, and thrive. Where an inclusive culture is lacking or rarefied, families will continue to face the grinding, consuming need to advocate for their child's rights in navigating ag against uh, uh, both um, overt discrimination within systems and also subtle soft discrimination at a cultural level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Malakas. And uh, I do not have more requests for, to take a floor. Yes, so please proceed. proceed to close. So, we, so may I thank all panelists for the great presentations and for all speakers for your participation in the discussion. So we have uh, to proceed to another interactive roundtable dialogue, and uh, I'm inviting rapporteurs of each panel no, no. here, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm inviting you. So thank you so much.